we have we had an extensive discussion on earlier sessions. I'm not gonna go on a on a skin barrier integrity testing. This is the, the three tests that you know uh, the PSU of ACYCLE can mention about it. Uh, so I'm gonna jump into the the discussion for the skin barrier integrity testing. Uh, my first question was, you know, uh, is uh, what is the purpose of skin barrier integrity testing? And we had an extensive discussion uh, in the presentation as well as the earlier Q and A uh, session. So I'm going to move to the, the next session. Next question is, what are the considerations to assure that the skin barrier is not compromised using respective approach of integrity testing? I know, Dr. Rene, you touch base uh, about this aspect about if you are, for example, if you are using the Trans epidermal electrical resistant approach, you know, you should not over hydrate the skin. But would you like to make any any quick comment or anybody from the uh, from the group? Um, yeah, I do feel like we have covered this in some of the previous discussions. But um, you know, some of these electrical tests um, don't don't fry the skin, <laughs> uh, don't submerge the skin. Uh, you know, be kind to the skin. <laughs> I think that TWL is probably the best choice of the options because it's non-invasive uh, and uh, does not come in direct contact with the skin itself uh, for the dosing area. Yeah, I'll support that as well. I mean, that's that's what we're moving towards is TWL. The tradiated water, um, I'm not sure how many people use it. That's kind of a pain because you, you need a radioactive lice. Uh, and then the the electrical impedance that's really never made sense to me because that's mostly used when you look at like um, tight junctions and other cell lines. I mean, we we use it when we're regrowing tissue to make sure that the the skin is is formed those tight junctions. So how that directly relates to to the stratum corneum, I think, is you're getting further away from damaged barrier, but also you're hydrating it, so you are changing it a little bit. Um, you try to minimize that, but it's also it's also labor intensive. And then how do you measure that afterwards? So if you get, especially if you got a formulation on there. Mm -hmm. Agreed. We, so we do PWL as well. Um, also the commercial equipment nowadays has a lot more calibrations and, and validations that come with it. So when you're trying to do GLP, GMP studies, it's quite important to have these equipment supported by the vendors. So I see there are three techniques and the trend is, you know, <laughs> is, Trend is moving towards the TWL because of you know the some of the the, the feature it provides you know you can avoid the over hydration issue or you know any other issue so yeah I can see that trend so in regard in context to the TWL what is the impact of critical element on the testing procedure for example the adapter size uh, a test parameter diffusion cell specification and there was a question about you know TWL should be measured outside or when the excise skin is mounted on the front diffusion cell. So any any comment from the group about you know in regards to the TWL measurement? So I really think here that it's important that the system is equilibrated, that the skin is equilibrated at you know physiological hydration, temper temperature. It's in the diffusion cell mounted uh, and equilibrated. And then you evaluate the the skin barrier integrity. Uh, I do think that TWL has a lot of advantages, um, but there's a lot of um, kind of engineering and technical science that goes into creating a TWL uh, outcome of value. And um, and I think it's outside the scope of of this workshop to to really get into. Uh, the different designs of uh, the TWL measurement devices, um, the way that they measure it, the way that they calculate it, how they utilize the probes that are within them, the geometries involved, and the types of things. We're talking about the impact of critical elements. It does depend a little bit upon the design of the TWL measuring apparatus as to what those critical elements end up being, how much calibration is going to be required, are they auto calibrating, and are they really compatible with the diffusion cells that you're using? And I think one of the, the uh, big, my hopes for the future is that diffusion cell manufacturers initiate a conversation with the manufacturers of these TWL apparatus so that there's a better understanding between the two of how these apparatus are interfacing with the uh, with the devices 
Um, but I, I won't say too much more than that because I think otherwise it gets a little bit complex to have a discussion of what, what those critical elements are. I think the main thing from a user's perspective is whichever device you're using, use it consistently. And that the numbers you get may not match up with the numbers that someone else is getting. This is in terms of the TWL uh, measurement values. Um, and that's part of the, what makes it challenging at this point with everyone using different apparatus uh, with trying to say that, well, here's the right number for your cutoff value. You know, this is why the conversation has trended in a different way at the moment. Yeah, and it's Sam, a very good know. point, Dr. Lin. Sorry, and Dr. Lin. I'll just speak from experience from having uh, designed diffusion cells and then actually having to design a TWL because we have a unique cell design. So making sure that adapter size is very specific for those diffusion cells. We also had to generate a TWL. We spent well over a year uh, getting that device ready uh, with appropriate qualifications. It is not easy. Um, we put the legwork in so we can now just modify the adapter for different cell types, and that's relatively easy. Um, on Friday, I'm actually going to share some data on how we qualified or how we get gain confidence in that instrument and show you some relatively large data sets when we're measuring lots of skin and potentially looking at a different way to look at cutoff criteria. That, that's, that's very that's a very good point. And, you know, I think the other factor is, are you using the, the open chamber or the closed chamber TWL instrument? So, you know, there are a lot of aspects, and as Dr. Danny mentioned, that, you know, it takes probably a whole session to talk about the, the skin barrier integrity. Uh, in the interest of time, I can move to, to the next question in this. We talked about the numbers. So, once the type of integrity testing is, is selected, how to determine the acceptance criteria or cutoff value to discriminate between the intact versus compromised skin barriers using the respective approach? I think that's probably something that everybody's struggling with. Um, you know, it's it's mostly to identify big holes, to be honest with you, um, or big, highly damaged uh, barrier, which lead to a lot of permeability, lead to a lot of variation. I think trying to find those subtleties of partially damaged is really challenging. Um, again, I'll, I'll share some data on Friday to show you kind of how we were trying to do that. Just using a series of tape strips is just kind of a crude way of disrupting the barrier. And then we looked at correlation and permeability after sort of doing that. I think some, as long as you have a control, um, there's multiple ways you can do that to kind of potentially artificially damage um, the barrier that might that is a way to kind of put the values in, into perspective. I would agree, and I, and I, I think John, you're, you're, you know, I have the same same perspective that you do. That we're looking here for gross damage, uh, something that allows us to have a well controlled study because we have a step in there that is an exclusion criterion for for something that just is clearly a junk piece of skin. Now, beyond that. I think you know it, it is, there can be a temptation to overinterpret uh, or inflate the importance of the skin barrier integrity test. Uh, there is natural variation in skin, and short of just having you know a really damaged skin section, it's very difficult to say. Well, this is where the the you know the the this is normal and that's abnormal. And in the next session this afternoon, we will talk a little bit about the fact that occasionally you get anomalous data. So you want to try to prevent anomalous data. You want to have some kind of control in there. But is it the kind of thing where you know, from my opinion, that we need to say, well, this is the right cutoff value. You use a slight height, likely higher cutoff value. Now your entire IVPT is not valid. I think that would be a mistake. I think we should be careful not to overinterpret or over police barrier integrity testing and just recognize that it's just a good practice, uh, not the kind of thing that we want to really look at the minutiae and then overinterpret the results. And I agree with that 100% um, accurate that we should build our own databases, but we should also have some human element of testing this integrity testing, right? So don't forget employee training. You know, every scientist who's going to work in this area must be thoroughly trained. You know, when you're trying to do this integrity testing with the removal and, and adding the adapters, it can damage the skin. And and you it will unnecessarily throw uh, delays in, in the start of the study. But also, uh, while the data may not be of as accurate uh, when it comes to choosing skin when we mount it on the chambers we try to avoid skin with stretch marks tattoos moles etc so when you remove those because some of these barrier integrity may not detect the, the difference between tissue with 
molds and tissue without molds. So have that human element, look into what you're doing. At the end of the day, uh, you know, the data is data and the human eye is human eye. Thank, thank you for your input. Uh, one of the questions I have is, you know, I think what we are talking about uh, here is about the pre-study skin barrier integrity testing. Now, on a numerous occasion, what we see that, you know, uh, there's sometimes we have seen a protocol saying that, you know, a post-study uh, skin barrier integrity testing and use that one as a justification to eliminate that cell or that particular replicate. What are some thoughts on, on a post-study skin barrier integrity testing? I think it's tough. <laughs> I, think, I think it's tough to interpret the results of, of what you're reading at that point, because the formulation, many of these formulations are designed to alter the skin barrier, you know, to, uh, to, to modulate the skin barrier in some way. Um, and, and now you've just had this formulation on there for an extended period. Um, and you're, I guess, then you're also washing it off. And so there's some other manipulation in, in um, uh, if, if it's an ointment or something like that, uh, are you, what kind of solvents are you using to, to wash that off? And could that be impacting uh, the skin barrier? So I, I don't think it's a clear answer. I think it's very difficult to interpret the results after the fact, um, because you're not just measuring what the native state of the skin is, you're measuring the effect of the treatment on the skin as well. I'm not saying it's not possible, uh, but the kind of controls that you need to have in place to interpret that I think are a little bit broader. Uh, you could have a parallel non-dosed skin section uh, that you monitor over time and say, well, in general, I expect, you know, that I have a population of undosed skins and I show that the barrier integrity is, you know, conserved over X amount of time. I think that is easier to interpret. Um, I can see that sometimes a, an individual replicate um, when affected by that formulation may be disproportionately affected by a particular formulation and, you know, it really did kind of have a, you know, it, the skin barriers really took a hit during the dosing period. Uh, and then you see that in your data and, um, and, you know, is it, is it reasonable to say, look, I can, I can even show you, I did the post barrier integrity test and look at compared to all of my other replicates, this one, something happened. I think that's, that's valuable information. So I think it's, it's a tough call. Um, you know, I'd be interested in thoughts from the rest of the group. But you know, the question is, is reverse of that. Suppose you get an abnormal EWL at the end of the study, but your data is identical to the other replicants that have a normal end of study TWL. So it, it, it just confounds the issues. Uh, if you have truly damaged the skin during dosing, probability is you will see a significantly increased delivery of drug to qualify that particular skin section as an outlier or aberrant data cell. Moreover, if your formulation contains some excipients that can interact with the skin and compromise its barrier, uh, it could be like permeation enhancers. You know, at the end of the study, obviously the electrical resistivity uh, would go down. I mean, uh, yes, it would increase and I'm sorry, electrical resistivity would de decrease and TW will increase. Um, so, what information are we getting out of this? You know, um, that's the question. So, so that's a great discussion, and I, you know, I think there are a lot of questions associated about the post study integrity, and we can, you know, keep discussing uh, down the road.